It is June 20, 2006. We're here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics on the campus of Rutgers University. This is another in the series of interviews we're conducting for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive as part of the Rutgers Governor's Program. Uh, our guest today is former Senator and Judge Martin Greenberg. Uh, this is the continuation of an earlier interview with uh, former uh, Senator Greenberg on his relationship with Governor Brendan Byrne. Senator, at the end of our last session, we had brought you up to Newark. You were an assistant prosecutor in Essex County working under Brendan Byrne. You're also um, pursuing the private practice of law as well as being an assistant prosecutor. At that time, New Jersey allowed assistant prosecutors to pursue a private practice. Tell us a little bit about how you balance those two different roles. Uh, the office was uh, composed of folks who for the most part were practicing privately while they were performing their functions as a system prosecutor. And in recognition of that fact, the system was that you would structure your week uh, based upon what cases were assigned to you and when they were going to be tried or prepared in a manner that required your presence. In general, you would put in about half time or maybe five eighths, three quarters in the prosecutor's office and then return to your practice, which you could handle until all hours of the evening and as the practice dictated. So um, we had a relatively small staff in the prosecutor's office. I would say at the very beginning it was 10 or 12 people. Uh, and we would work it out so that um, there were uh, two folks assigned to each desk. Uh, and you would work uh, in the morning at the desk and go back to your office in the afternoon. And then the afternoon shift would come in. But you would work it out with your desk mate, so to speak, so that you would have a desk available. And uh, you would have your cases uh, prepared by the investigators and detectives with your assistance telephonically if you were not in, but uh, preferably be there on the scene at the time of interviews of witnesses, et cetera. We were spending a good three quarters of the time of the working day, it, normal working day in the prosecutor's office, and again as much time after that into the early evening at the, at the uh, law, at a law firm. <coughs> and, excuse me, <coughs> uh, I, I had a uh, position with a uh, firm, small firm of three attorneys uh, that I had known from before I became an attorney. And uh, we'd, you'd walk to your office from the prosecutor's office and walk back again. We were within blocks of both locations. Before we leave the days in the prosecutor's office, what type of uh, boss was Brendan Byrne as prosecutor? Was he very hands-on? Did he get involved with the investigations? Or was he more uh, the type of prosecutor who set a, a large direction to the staff? and pretty much let you uh, assistant prosecutors do your own thing? It's a combination. If it were a critical case, a significant case, a first degree murder case, or a political corruption case, uh, he would be very hands-on. Uh, in many instances, I shouldn't say that, in some instances he tried the case himself. And obviously that would require his, uh, his full, uh, full time preparation and he was a wonderfully prepared prosecutor. Uh, by that I mean uh, he would interview the witnesses himself. He would uh, do the research or at least read the research that had been done with regard to a charge or a charge to the jury, etc. Uh, and uh, those cases which were not many, but important, uh, he, would, he would deal with, as I've just described. Beyond that, uh, he, was, uh, he was a, a, 
a boss, and we all loved him as a boss, and we referred to him as the boss, <coughs> uh, would from time to time check to see how a case was going and its preparation, et cetera, and stop in during the course of a trial to see how his assistants were uh, progressing. He knew what the cases were about. He knew what was being what was being tried, what was being prepared, etc. But for the most part, you had your own head, and you, as an assistant prosecutor, would um, set up the case, put the put the, uh, the the witnesses in order, and review the case with your staff, the detectives and investigators and not come into contact directly with Brendan at that stage in the preparation of the case. Um, we had meetings every Friday morning at, I think, 8 o'clock. Um, and uh, my recollection is that court was not in session at that hour or for that day, I don't recall. But I know we were there for at least an hour, and we would review, and he would sit and conduct the process of reviewing what trials were being conducted, where we were in the trials, and uh, how it was going. And everyone who was interested contributed to a discussion about the case, or a case. Um, but for the most part, we were concerned about our own matters. And uh, we had uh, a report on new decisions which someone was assigned to brief us on. And it was a business, very business-like meeting for about an hour, hour and a half, et cetera. And Brendan was there, and he was interested and involved in the discussions and would raise some uh, questions about a decision or how it would impact us, et cetera. He was a hands-on prosecutor full-time. In terms of the major directions for the office that Brendan Burns set as prosecutor, you mentioned in your first uh, session that organized crime at that uh, period in Essex County and New Jersey generally was a fairly significant force that law enforcement was attempting to confront. This was also an area and a topic that later was critical uh, or important at least to Brendan Burns' political career uh, in his first run for office. Uh, was this sort of un unstated or was it within your staff uh, a major objective that dealing with organized crime, dealing also with gambling as sort of the financing tool for organized crime was a major goal for the prosecutor's office under, under Brendan Byrne? Uh, the cases that were tried, criminal cases that were tried that involved organized crime for the most part were gambling cases. Um, there was a recognition of the fact that there was organized crime. Uh, and I, as an assistant prosecutor, did not participate in the organized crime unit established uh, and instead was, were, were assigned cases to try, and I did. So I had, I had little contact with the operation of the organized crime section. Uh, of the office. My recollection is that in terms of the manpower that was being um, available and spent in the prosecutor's office, uh, organized crime was uh, a, a recognized as in existence, but most of the time consumed by the prosecutor's office was in the prosecution of cases that we brought to the grand jury and tried. And overwhelmingly, those were not non-organized crime cases. At some point, you make a decision to go to private practice full-time instead of balancing the public and private roles that you had been uh, pursuing. Uh, tell us a little bit about the personal considerations you had in making that decision. Sure. Um, when I came out of the Attorney General's office at uh, the request of uh, Brendan Byrne to join him as an assistant prosecutor, actually as a Deputy Attorney General, because we had difficulty getting confirmed, which I think I discussed earlier, uh, for political reasons. Um, I, uh, 
I became involved and in, uh, a partner in a law firm uh, with a couple of folks that I had known from earlier on in my life. And I was attempting to build a practice because I did not intend to become a, um, or remain a prosecutor for any significant length of time. I thought I'd make my contribution and learn what uh, I could in terms of trying a case. After our short break, uh, Senator, let's continue with the period when you're in the Essex County Prosecutor's Office and also practicing privately. Uh, what were the options you were considering at that time in terms of your future career? Well, I was getting to the point uh, I say I went there in 59, so this was about 61, uh, where I, uh, I was interested in, in seeing whether or not I could de develop a practice. Um, and so I was spending more time in the practice, private practice, and less time in the prosecutor's office for a short period of time when I recall Brendan um, asking me whether I was interested in joining his firm. At that time, there were essentially uh, two partners, Brendan and Harold Teltzer, and there were a couple of associates working there. And I was interested, and I told them that. And I interviewed uh, with Harold, whom I did not know before that. Um, and Brendan, and uh, they offered me a position as an associate in that firm, and I accepted it, told uh, the folks over at the other firm that I would be leaving, and why and where I was going, and then I resigned from the prosecutor's office. So I was then working full-time uh, practicing law. Going back a year or so, in 1960, all, uh, there also was the uh, presidential election uh, where John Kennedy was elected president and also uh, during the run-up to the nomination by the Democratic Party of John Kennedy your former boss and Brendan Burns former boss Governor Minor made a foray into national politics uh, but I b believe you were not politically involved at that time, but did you discuss at all with Brendan Byrne the minor sort of candidacy and his role at the National Democratic Convention? Not at that time, and I do not remember discussing it subsequently either. And I had no political aspirations at that time, and I was not politically active. So I, what I knew about it is what I read in the papers and what I discussed with my friends. Now we're at the point where you're in full-time private practice, you still have communications with uh, Brendan Byrne from time to time. What topics did you talk about and what uh, sort of relationships? Were they purely social, business, or whatever? No, he was my, he became my partner. Later. Because after about a year or right. so, I became a partner in that firm. And our discussions were purely and simply about the practice of law and the, outside of the prosecutor's office. I rarely discussed uh, the prosecutor's office with him, except in passing, where uh, some of my friends had still were still located, and uh, we would chat from time to time. But our meetings were about clients and developing a practice, and Brendan was a part of that. Obviously, uh, uh, not in criminal, civil uh, matters. Any discussion of local politics? If so, I can't recall any. Oh yeah, and there came a point in time where the, the designation uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, was uh, no longer necessary because there was confirmation. I can't recall when it, when it happened. Um, and I think it happened while I was still in the office where we were all sworn in as prosecutors and no longer, uh, no longer uh, designated as deputy attorneys general. That would have involved a discussion about a rapprochement with uh, the county chairman, et cetera. I did not play a part in that. 
Uh, in those days, how did you build a private uh, practice? Well, you, you, uh, I suspect, as most people do, you started with your friends and your contacts, and you um, got active in the Bar Association, and you, um, you uh, took assignments from the partners, or in this case, partner was Harold Telser for the most part, was, develop was developing his, and he had a practice at that time. And I would handle cases for him and them. Uh, we had a couple of unions that we represented, uh, and some uh, friends of the family brought matters in. And slowly over the year or so or two, um, I had some reputation as a trial attorney from the prosecutor's office, so I did get some matters to me, brought to me directly by the client, uh, essentially in the civil area. I'm trying to recall whether there was any criminal no, there was no criminal practice because of Brendan's association with the prosecutor's office. So it was all civil, and it was word of mouth, and it was friends and uh, clubs and uh, neighbors, typical way. When you come from a family that doesn't have any lawyers in it uh, and had no uh, uh, no friends of the family who had legal problems of significance. Uh, that's how a practice would be built. Uh, and that's what I did. Hmm. Did your father's role in the labor uh, movement have any uh, positive impact on yeah, the practice? Sh shortly after I joined uh, Brendan's firm, uh, there were a couple of labor unions that sought me out. They were not in my father's union and it was not with his knowledge, as I understand it, asked me if I would be available to represent them in connection with organization, organizational activities of a union and, uh, and uh, workers' compensation cases and matters involving automobile accidents of their members, et cetera, the typical stuff you would do if you were representing a union. Mm -hmm. And what was Brendan Burns' particular area in private practice that he found the most enjoyable? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I rarely saw him in the office. He spent almost all of his time in the prosecutor's office. Uh, and occasionally a matter would come in from or through Brendan who would be a family member or a friend of a family member, et cetera. And there was no um, significant um, business, in quotes, produced by Brendan in that firm. But we loved him and we wanted to see him as often as we could. Okay. Well, let's bring the story f a f few years f forward. Uh, what are your recollections and particularly your relationship with Brendan Byrne after this point where you're, you're in his firm practicing privately? Uh, he's still in the prosecutor's office. Uh, what happened next? Uh, that office grew uh, dramatically uh, from 10, 12, assistance to 25 and 50, uh, business increased, so to speak, in the prosecutor's office. And um, Brendan became more and more uh, a full-time, full-time prosecutor. He had essentially been that from the beginning, but we hardly saw him, uh, except uh, for dinner occasionally or breakfast meetings, et cetera. Uh, and, and so, um, Harold and I had, uh, I became a partner after about a year, and Harold and I expanded the firm. Um, we brought in some folks who had been in the prosecutor's office that were seeking to practice privately. And so that firm started to grow, and, and Brendan did not change his relationship with it. He remained uh, tangentially associated with it. Uh, I don't think he handled matters. I recall one matter where he and I appeared together in a, in a, in a civil case. Uh, and the next m recollection I have is Brendan's um, departing from the prosecutor's office. I don't remember how that occurred. I don't think, I, I think it was at the end of a term. Well, there were five year terms, I believe. Uh, and I think he went from there to the 
Public Utilities Commission, PUC, as chairman. I can't recall the year, and I don't remember the circumstances. Hmm. And, so, and you don't recall any conversation with him about his decision to uh, accept the appointment to the Public Utilities Commission? No. Just that he was going, and uh, we would miss him. And I assume your contact with him then either dropped considerably, uh, given that he had no formal relationship. Th that's true. We saw him from time to time, socially. Um, we being Harold and I, and Brendan, uh, and uh, at times as socially at, with our wives and uh, Jean, mm -hmm. infrequently though. Mm. Now, at some point, you start to get involved in local politics in Essex County. Uh, talk about uh, how that occurred and uh, so who the key p key players were. Sure. So let's say I would leave the I would have left I did leave the prosecutor's office I believe in. 61, 62, and practiced into the, I'm now, I'm now thinking about in the early, early 70s, um, and building a nice practice. Harold and I had a decent practice. And we had some other folks in the firm who were working and bringing in clients, and uh, we were not going to, uh, challenge any significant law firm with our practice, but uh, we had a good time, we were happy with each other, and we were uh, comfortable. Uh, and I started to get itchy about doing the same thing for 10 years now. And so um, I uh, put my foot in the water and decided to run uh, as a county committee person in Livingston, where I was living with my wife, and at that time, I think one or two of my sons, I have three sons and one daughter, so we had two children at the time, and I ran and lost. Uh, but it was interesting, and uh, county chairman at the time, I think it was Dennis Carey, I can't recall. Uh, saw me at a dinner. I started to go to the, the Democratic functions and said, well, why did you run against the party uh, chairperson, uh, 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 committeeman? Uh, I said, because I wanted to get involved and I didn't know how else to do it. He said, well, you could have knocked on the door, come in and see me, etc." I said, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so he said, yeah, that's what people do. Uh, I said, well, thanks for the advice. Uh, and uh, that continued for a while until um, a friend of mine was running for the United States Senate. His name is uh, Bob Peacock. I had met him in the Attorney General's office. I think he was Commissioner of Insurance or Deputy Commissioner of Insurance, Bob Miner's campaign uh, term. And, uh, and Bobby asked me if I would run a dinner for him among attorneys. And I said, yes, I would, and I did, and we raised some money for him. And he lost. He was running against, I, I don't remember if he got the nomination, but I know the senator at the time was Clifford Case. I don't think, I think maybe Bob did get the nomination. Any event, some more years went by, and um, I became more and more interested in the party and what was going on in Washington and locally. Uh, and a Senate race was shaping up for, I would say, 1970, 1971. And at that time, there were uh, five senators in Essex County, and you ran at large. And Bob Peacock came back to me, uh, not having seen him in a few years, and he said, why don't you take a shot at the Senate? I will be happy to support you as the chairman of Li the Livingston Democratic Party, which he was. And let me worry about trying to get you on the A-line. And the next thing that happened is I had a meeting with the then chairman, Harry Lerner, who said, uh, Bob Peacock speaks highly of you, and uh, 
we would like you to be a part of the ticket. Something else happened in the meantime. Uh, there is an organization called uh, City of Hope. It deals with uh, um, emphysema, the condition known as emphysema. It's located in California. And one of my friends asked me if I, he was a labor leader, local union, asked me if I would be the um, honoree of a dinner. Uh, I said, well, let me, I explored what the organization was all about and I saw it was a good thing. I, if they wanted to use my name for purposes of uh, selling tickets to uh, other labor organizations because it was a labor-sponsored dinner, essentially. And uh, my father had been and was at that time International Union president, having been elected in the six, early 60s or late 50s. So he was fairly well known and he had a large organization in the United States and Canada. And I suppose they used my name and his relationship with me and the rest of you to sell tickets to employers and labor leaders, et cetera. And I invited my friends to sit at the dais, including David Satz, who had been United States attorney Brendan Byrne. This was a non-political affair, so I had the county chairman, Harry Lerner, and a bunch of labor guys, and uh, made my first large to, uh, speech to a large audience, and it was horrible, they tell me. It was really bad. Um, at content or at delivery or both? both? <laughs> Nothing was good about it. I learned some stuff. Um, short jokes, very, mm -hmm. very short and quick. Um, you hadn't learned that in the Catskills? And <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't apply what I had learned in the Catskills. Had I done so, I probably would have done a better job. In any event, um, my name started to be more well known in uh, Essex County. Uh, and so Bobby Peacock came and asked me if I would take a shot at this. He would like to su support me and endorse me. I said, I really, you know, if I'm known, it's in, uh, it's in West Orange and South, Or and South Orange and that part of Essex County where I lived. And I didn't know, I didn't even know where Nutley was, Bellevue. And my name was Greenberg, it still is. And uh, I didn't think I could bring anything to the ticket. He said, well, you know, it isn't a ticket that's being elected, it's your individual. And I was given a spot on it at the, at the Democratic County uh, Nominating Committee meeting. Uh, and I was one, two, three, fourth name on the line. Um, and it was a two-year term at the time. It, I think it was two, four, and four. And um, the first three got elected, Democrats and the Republicans caught the next two. Uh, and I learned about campaigning and going from house party to house party. Uh, and uh, I expected to win. Uh, I didn't know that uh, uh, relationships would be formed between candidates from the, very, from the two tickets. I learned that afterwards. I was totally naive. Uh, and uh, I came in sixth, I think, out of uh, ten folks. <clears throat> and uh, I was upset. It was the first shot at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, an election of consequence. And I'd lost, and I had a bad taste in my mouth. What were the relationships or the deals made in your campaign that you weren't aware of at the time? Well, I was advised, and I don't know whether or not it's true, that uh, one of our candidates had formed a relationship with one or more candidate on the other ticket uh, based upon uh, religion, ethnicity, uh, and so 
the uh, those candidates that uh, shared that uh, religious conviction won across the board. I don't know if it's true. I you know I gather it's too it's too suspicious not to have been arranged. It's too coincidental. In any event, uh, I now understood something that I didn't learn before. But it, it hardly mattered because the next time an election occurred, districts had been formed. And so you would be running one against one. So I didn't have to concern myself with my back, so to speak. We'll talk a little bit more about the sort of ethnic politics of Essex County at the time. Well, uh, sure. The I, Byrne I, family was obviously politically uh, prominent in, in West Orange. Uh, uh, the Degnans also, Irish Americans in uh, West Orange, but there were also strong Italian uh, uh, political people and sort of an emerging, I guess, Jewish uh, constituency. Was there a deliberate effort to sort of package tickets to, oh, sure. to, to meet each constituency's oh, sure. interests? For example, when I first ran and we had five candidates for five spots, uh, you had uh, Pat Dodd, um, Winona Lipman. An African-American woman. Yeah, but folks voted for her because they thought she was Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know who she was. Uh, and uh, me, and a, a, a Polish-American uh, candidate from Irvington. And, Oh, and, and an, another, an additional Italian, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Carmen Orecchio. So you try to balance your ticket with all of the, the ethnic, uh, major ethnic groups represented, which is what happened. Um, and the other side was exactly the same. The Republicans did exactly the same because, yeah, you know, you, you went into a place like uh, Belleville uh, or Nutley or Bloomfield, uh, and that was a strong Italian stronghold at the time. Newark obviously was, uh, in most areas of Newark, uh, the, uh, the black population dominated, so you had to have, you had to have black representation. Um, the, the, the Polish and the Jewish communities were much smaller in number, so those two candidates, me and the fellow from Irvington, were the fourth and fifth, if you go across the line. Uh, you have to really want to vote the line in order to get to us, and you lose people at, that, at those spots. Was there a political power broker for the Jewish constituency sure. at that time? Yeah. Who was that? His name was Macklin Goldman. He owned Goldman's Hotel in West Orange. He had been a state senator. Uh, and he was on the executive committee of the Democratic Party. How did he exercise his power? Was it informally? Was it uh, direct? And did you have to go interview him and convince him of your uh, credentials? There was only one boss, and that was Harry Lerner, who happened to be Jewish. Uh, and whom I did not know, except as I ran into him at that dinner that I described, and uh, got to know him during the campaign, where he consented to my being on the ticket. So uh, I was I was not a someone who came up through the ranks, and I had to be sold to him. And I think Bob Peacock did that together with some folks from Livingston, who didn't control much of the uh, of the. Uh, politics at the county level, but had significance in Livingston and, and South Orange. And you could bring, a Jewish candidate could bring, assuming that ethnicity was a factor, could bring to the table uh, significant votes in those two communities. You said you had a sour taste in your mouth after that first like campaign. like losing. I mean, that was a very bad thing for me. But it didn't sour you enough to give up politics. No, on the it contrary. I wanted, a, I wanted a shot again. And then I ran into a problem because, uh, as I understood it from Harry, uh, he had already promised that spot 
that spot being the 28th uh, district, which was um, South Orange, Irvington, and Newark, did not include West Orange, where most of the folks that I knew were living. Uh, and he had committed that, or told me that he had advised uh, someone that they could have that shot. And in those days, the county chairman, and I suppose to a large extent today, uh, made the decision and then there was a rubber stamp by the committee. What year would this have been? That was for the 1973 campaign election in which Brendan Byrne was elected governor. Now, when did your political contacts renew with Brendan Byrne uh, as he becomes and considers a candidacy in 73? After I had uh, obtained the uh, endorsement of Harry Lerner to run, and he had changed his mind apparently with regard to that spot, the Democratic Senate candidate in the 28th district, after I had obtained that nomination and endorsement from Harry Lerner, I got a telephone call from Brendan who said he'd like to, would I come up and have lunch? He was on the bench. So he had left the Public Utilities Commission and become a assignment judge in Morris County. Do you recall any talk about an earlier candidacy by Brendan Byrne, perhaps in the 1969 campaign? I do not. I do not. We always talked about Brendan being the perfect candidate for governor and would make a wonderful governor, but that was from the early days, even in the prosecutor's office. But nobody seconded that motion. There was never any, it never got past his immediate friends, nor was he pushing it. Well, let's go back again to 1973 and your role in that first campaign. Okay, I'm on the ticket. And uh, the head of that ticket was the gentleman that I quote, replaced, close quote. As I said in those days, it was you were, you were a senator from Essex County, not from a district, when I lost my first uh, race. And j just for background, that change occurred because of, because of one man, one vote, and court decisions which threw out the old county-based districting pattern. Correct. And so the folks who had some say in, in the districting process would be the incumbent senators, for example, and the counties that had delivered democratic pluralities. Uh, and so the district in which I was living, which was, and I lived in South Orange at the time, was the 28th district. And as I said, it was composed of uh, Irvington, South Orange, and a piece of Newark. It's a safe district. And the senator who lived in it was Ralph DeRose, who determined that he wanted to run for governor and had the endorsement of the Essex County organization, Harry Lerner, et cetera. So there I was on the ticket as the Senate candidate from the 28th district, and my, the head of my ticket, the head of the ticket that I was on was Ralph DeRose, who also lived in the Senate in the South Orange. Uh, and I received a telephone call from Brendan Byrne, who said he'd been approached. I went to have lunch with him. He told me he was approached to run, and he was thinking about it, and what did I think? We talked about who approached him and how that happened and what he thought he needed and wanted to know what my views were on the subject. Do you want to identify the people who approached him? Yeah, he told me uh, Don Land, who was the county chairman of Union County at the time, uh, and had other chairmen, the names of whom, and I don't remember, but some smaller counties, supporting Brendan. He wouldn't have Huts as Essex, because that was already committed to Ralph, and um, I was sure all hell was going to break loose when it would be announced, because here was another Essex boy, so to speak. Um, challenging the organization in Essex County. And Brendan had a great reputation in Essex County, having been prosecutor and coming from a political 
politically connected family. His father was in politics all his life, as I recall, as I've been told. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your question. Well, you're put in a fairly difficult personal and political position in this race because you're running on a the Essex County organization if, ticket. Sure, if that were to happen, I envisioned that I would have difficulty and I didn't know what the reaction of the chairman would be and the party itself. Because don't forget, we are at the stage now where it's in the primary stage. And um, there were folks that were going to be running against us in the primary, headed, I think, by, in my district, there was Joel Jacobson, who was a friend of mine from the labor movement. He was the United, United Auto Workers, I believe, the old CIO. Uh, so we were looking at that primary, and then I envisioned if Brendan took a shot at it, uh, he would be obviously on a different line in the primary, so we would have, in a sense, three lines. Uh, the regular organization, the, the uh, Jacobson organization, and Brendan. Uh, that did not interfere with my analysis of whether he should go or not. He asked me as a friend what I thought, and I thought he would make a great governor. I didn't know if he could get the nomination, and it appeared to me that he wasn't really committed to be a judge, being a judge. I didn't think that he would uh, entertain it, entertain an uphill battle. He didn't have, he didn't have at that moment in time support, sufficient support to win a primary. He would need at least one major county, and that was Hudson. But your advice to him was to go for it? Not only go for it, uh, but um, come back to the firm so he had a place to hang his hat, a place to have meetings. Um, and uh, we would uh, compensate him for his uh, services to the firm, whatever that might be in some small fashion, but provide him with the wherewithal to, to uh, exist during that primary period. And I never gave thought to what would happen afterwards if he lost. Brendan Byrne, I, I would never concern myself with whether Brendan could earn a living or find a place to land. So the fact that he would be leaving the bench was not of consequence, in my opinion, to his life. Uh, and I could see he wanted to do it. After this meeting with Brendan Byrne, did you then go to the county organization and the, ch and the chairman and sort of fess up that you've had this discussion? I wanted to get there before it hit the papers. <laughs> 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 and uh, to his credit, after Harry Lerner simmered down, uh, he said he's going to lose. I said, well, they'll lose then. Uh, to his credit, Harry said, look, you cannot campaign for him. Do you have friends or family someplace in Europe? That's where you should go during the course of this primary. I said, no, I don't but I don't intend to campaign uh, for him. He said, look, whatever you're going to do, I know your friends and your former partners, you have to be out of sight. So you can't, you can't come out. And you have a, you have a, a team that you're, that you're speaking for, and it's headed by uh, our candidate for governor. I don't expect you to campaign for Ralph DeRose, but I do expect you not to campaign for Brendan Byrne. I said, it wouldn't make a difference I don't have that much influence, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it would it would not be the right thing to do. So I, I, uh, I said I would I would be below the radar. And it, as it developed, uh, Brendan, I'm fast forwarding now, got sufficient commitments so that he made the leap, resigned, and we opened up the first office in our law firm. And then we found some headquarters, et cetera, et cetera. And I became his um, uh, unofficial 
Um, the title I've seen on memos is political director. Yeah, but that was in the general election, not in, not in the, the primary. primary. I wouldn't do that. What contacts, if any, did you have with Del Ralph DeRose during this period? Well, he lived around the corner from me. He practiced law around the corner from us. Uh, I had his uh, seat uh, that I was running for, so to speak. And we would appear together at campaign stops. Um, as the campaign progressed on the issue of my relationship with him, uh, and we're still in the primary stage at that point, I suggested to Brendan, we had picked up Hudson County, and the polls were looking good, uh, that it would be a whole lot easier if Ralph DeRose were not in the race. And um, I offered to have a discussion with Ralph to see if I couldn't convince him that he was not going to win. And that if he were so convinced, I would suggest to him that I would withdraw as a candidate for the Senate. And he could then return to the Senate where he had been serving in the Byrne administration. Uh, and that. Uh, if that were acceptable to the chairman and to Ralph, uh, I would tell Brendan that that's what I wanted to do. And I had already discussed it with Brendan initially, and he didn't think Ralph would withdraw. And I met with Ralph, and he refused to withdraw. In fact, he said, well, you know, tell Brendan he's not going to make it. And, you know, it's foolish for him to continue, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, listen, after the results are in, if you lose, please don't come back to me and ask me to resign from a seat that I will have, or not won, but at least become the Democratic candidate for um, in the general election. Um, because at that point in time, I, I think it's too late to do that, and I don't think it would be appropriate for you or me or the governor to be. He said, don't worry, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to win. And that's the way we went the rest of the way. I would appear with him, Ralph, and the rest of our ticket, and uh, I would meet with Brendan uh, in the afternoons at his, whenever I was free at his office, at his uh, headquarters. And everybody knew I was running on the other line and what the situation was. And I was satisfied that Harry Lerner was satisfied with what I was doing. So it was open. Everybody knew it. And I didn't, you know, I don't think it appeared anywhere in any press. They may have alluded to it from time to time, the fact that I had been his partner. but. Um, no one suggested that I was campaigning for him, and I was not. At these public appearances with Ralph DeRose, did you feel awkward, or was the relationship no. strained? No. No, it was easy for me because he, he was actually very strongly convinced that he was a shoe in So he didn't mind that I was kind of hanging around. Now, Sort of under the radar, you also have frequent contacts with the Byrne primary campaign people. Talk a little bit about those people and who the key players were. Well, uh, my real connection with them occurred after the primary in the general election. During the primary, um, uh, I repeat, I was, I was not active in the, in the campaign structure. I was there. Uh, to really be a friend to Brendan and talk to him about what was going on. I did not have a relationship with uh, Don Land during the primary. I did not participate in fundraising. Um, and I can't tell you much about that because I didn't participate in it. I was in and out of meetings with Brendan as to how he was feeling and what kind of 
you know, what did, I, what did I think about his chances and stuff like that. But I, I, I really wasn't lining up votes for him and I wasn't raising money for him and I didn't interface with the folks who were. Now, some of those folks uh, were from Essex County, such as Alan Sagner. When, what was your first sort of uh, uh, political contact with, with Alan? Uh, Alan tells me when I see him from time to time at the Performing Arts Center, for example, last couple of weeks ago, uh, that I was the guy who got him into politics. I have no recollection of that. Uh, I remember dealing with Alan Sagner for the first time after the primary. His recollection is that I got him into politics. I, I, haven't, I haven't quantified what he meant by that, but I think he's mistaken. Uh, I believe he said that in his first interview session. He's coming back for a second, so we'll you can pry. Uh, I remember seeing Alan Sagner in my law office, however, and I know that he was there and that um, he teamed up with Brendan, and I believe he was his uh, a significant, if not the most significant, uh, fundraiser for the governor. Um, and uh, we talked. I didn't know him before that. And his recollection that I brought him in, I think, is erroneous. But I don't know why he says it someday I'll find out, or maybe you will in the next <laughs> session okay. with him. Uh, so I can't really be of assistance with regard to the primary. Obviously, I never appeared with Brendan in the primary, and I never discussed where he should go, and I don't really know who was around him. See, my, my, my knowledge of the folks that became important to him, like Caden and Leon came after the primary because they were on another ticket. I mean, they were working with, what was his name? I don't recall. Candidate for Mercer County. Dick Coffey. Yeah, Dick Coffey. And I think Dick pulled out before the, the end of the primary and they uh, came over to assist Brendan. Uh, I, di I did not deal with that subject. I don't know. My, uh, the, the title that you mentioned earlier about political whatever it was, uh, that developed obviously after the primary when I surfaced as a, as a candidate on Brendan's ticket. Before we leave the primary, uh, in addition to Ralph DeRose, what are your re recollections of the other candidates in, in the primary field for governor? Ann Klein, for example. Yeah, you mean Democrats, right. obviously. <clears throat> and also their political bases and sort of strategies for winning the nomination. You know, you have to, um, you start with the premise that this is my first real experience in politics. When I ran and lost, I was just a neophyte. I had no idea what was going on around the state and obviously even less in Essex County. Uh, except that I, I, what I learned afterwards was occurring. So during the primary, um, we actually were competing with another ticket. I mean, I would debate with Joel Jacobson. By that I mean he would be there with four other uh, folks who were supporting him uh, as speaking at labor uh, uh, meetings, and I was invited to those as well, or invited myself. Uh, so I was busy. Uh, and all I can tell you about what the situation was in the primary is what I learned secondhand. I was not active in Brendan's campaign, but I kept abreast of what the campaign uh, uh, reaction was to the polling that had occurred, and it was clear that Brendan was a formidable candidate and was, in fact, uh, close to taking Essex County. And he was not ahead, but he was close enough so that he could neutralize effectively uh, DeRose's connection with Essex. And if Hudson was there, together with the other uh, uh, smaller counties, Brendan was going to win. 
the other candidates were non-events to me. Mm -hmm. There was no challenge that I saw that was credible. There was some talk, I believe, about Henry Congressman Helstosky entering the race that, in fact, never happened. Do you recall anything? I do not. It's the first time I've heard of that. Well, you uh, run in the primary, and you are nominated for the <coughs> Senate seat. Uh, Ralph DeRose is defeated. Uh, what do you recall of election day and election night and your reaction to Brendan Burns' nomination and your own? After, well, <sighs> after I took the returns at my headquarters, which happened to be in South Orange, I went to Brendan's headquarters, and I can't recall where it was. I think it was in uh, right off the parkway. I, I don't remember. In any event, everyone was ecstatic there, as they were in my own headquarters, but I had obviously a much smaller group. Uh, and I remember Brendan coming over to me and hugging me, and he said to me, the first thing I asked was, did Marty win when he came downstairs from the hotel room, I think. And he said, congratulations. I congratulated him. We were both overjoyed. Uh, it was uh, happy days are here again. Uh, and I stayed around and schmoozed with uh, the folks, uh, many of whom I knew, but you know, from visiting the headquarters from time to time. Uh, and um, it was a party. It was a congratulatory party. And at the end of the day, end of the evening, I don't know, 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11, I left and I went to Ralph's house. He lived around the corner from me in South Orange. I passed it on the way home. I hadn't made a phone call. But I saw his car in the driveway and I pulled in. And he and a couple of folks were there. And I uh, commiserated with him. And um, he was down. And I tried to cheer him up. Of course, we had a general coming up. I mean, we had an election to deal with at that point. And Ralph was still a formidable personage and was a senator and still uh, had a uh, relationship with Harry Lerner. Harry lost, Ralph lost. And um, I wanted to try to maintain a relationship of some kind. We had a discussion about my leaving the Senate at that point, that is to say, the option that he had, uh, had extended to him, he was ready to accept. Which you hadn't offered. And I, uh, I said, no, as I told you, that, that, that option expired. Uh, and he, you know, didn't, up, was not upset at that reaction, I assume. He, uh, he anticipated it. Plus, I think he understood that Ralph, that Brendan was likely to become governor or at least had a great opportunity. We didn't know who the candidate was at that moment, I don't think. I can't recall. In any event, the vote was uh, spoke volumes about Brendan's uh, ability to attract New Jersey voters. Do you think Ralph DeRose kept that optimism that he was going to get the nomination into Election Day? Absolutely. So he was shocked? Shocked. Couldn't believe it. Of course, this was the days before polls got every day tracking the right. voter it was, a, it, was, it was a kind of a gut reaction you have when you're in politics. He had been in the Senate for several years and had the Essex County organization behind him and whatever other counties were telling him, whatever they're telling him, he expected to win. So he was shocked. But he, he was not um, bitter toward me. And that was important to me because I envisioned him to be a factor in the general election. And that was, I, I stopped at his house for two reasons. One. I don't know which was more important, but they were both important. I, I, I thought he was a friend or somebody that I would be dealing with, and I wanted to keep the door open. And I also wanted to make him feel that somebody cared, mm. 
even though I had hoped, and he knew that I hoped that Brendan would beat him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we said goodnight, and you know, there, there's more to the story of Ralph the Rose because he, ob he, he, he has a position then that he assumes in the Byrne administration. Uh, and to, you know, fast forward to that, he, he seemed to be working with us in the general election. And Brendan and I discussed uh, whether Ralph should be considered for some position in the administration. Ultimately, I believe, um, I think he became by state waterfront commissioner. Hmm. I can't recall. Do you recall your first contact with Harry Lerner after the primary election day? Yeah. And what was that like? Well, uh, Harry now had a senator who was the governor's law partner. And Harry knew that I was indebted to him for permitting me to run in a safe district over someone who is a friend of the family. So Harry had every reason to believe that I would be as helpful to him as I could and had the ear of the governor. And so Harry was, if you weren't going to have the governor on the ticket, at least you had in your camp the governor's former law partner who was your senator and owed you. That's what I think Harry thought. So we did not have, I mean, we, we went through the results and how it happened, but it was like talking to a friend, not a guy that you were opposed to. In retrospect, looking back over these many years, do you feel that Harry Lerner had this sort of scheme that he couldn't lose one way or another? He'd either have I think, his I, senator I, I as the gubernatorial candidate, or uh, he'd have you as Brendan Burns yeah. sort of copied up. Uh, I think the way his mind worked, that when he didn't ask me to withdraw or tell me I had to, or he was going to pull it or whatever, you could do under those circumstances, that that was certainly something that was kicking around in, in, in his mind. And if I agreed not to be a factor and embarrass him by coming out f publicly for Brendan in some form, that um, he did have uh, a shot at not being a loser, a total loser. He would have, a, he would have access to the governor. So fast forwarding to your later career in Atlantic City, he was buying insurance <laughs> and hedging his bets. Uh, well, don't forget, I mean, he didn't create this situation. So when, it, when he was confronted with it, he had a choice of, of alienating a guy who might be governor, because he knew that Brendan and I were close friends. Uh, and and he, you know, he didn't gain anything by, he would not have gained anything by doing that. So, um, I think it is not unlikely that he thought about the benefits of having me there. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have to do anything to do it. It was already in place. Well, on primary day, surprisingly, Governor Cahill gets beaten by Congressman Sandman. Uh, we've had in other interviews a lot of discussion about the politics of the Republican Party and how that came to pass. Uh, but what was your sort of personal reaction to the uh, nomination of Congressman Sandman and the defeat of an incumbent governor for renomination? Everything was falling into place. I mean, we thought that uh, Charlie Sandman would be a, uh, a, a candidate that we could more likely defeat than Cahill. Uh, and, uh, we were, we were happy with it, and uh, we were confident at that point. Were you surprised? At the, uh, yeah. I think we were surprised. We were all surprised. Everyone that was involved in that process was surprised, pleased and surprised. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, now the general election campaign starts. Uh, 
Let's discuss your role. It's a more formal, more visible role in the general election, as you've already mentioned. Uh, but exactly what did you do on a day-to-day -day basis, both in your own campaign and in the Byrne gubernatorial campaign? Uh, I assume the position in Brendan's campaign, it, it, uh, the title was political director, director uh, after I discussed it with Harry Lerner. I wanted to keep that relationship with Harry Lerner viable, good, etc. because if we won, um, I, I, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to make it as smooth as possible for Brendan dealing with the Essex County Senators. And while they were my friends at that point, having campaigned, gotten to know them in the campaign, even though we weren't in the same district, their allegiance was to Harry Lerner, not to me. So that was a uh, important, it was important that whatever I was going to do with Brendan, Harry knew about. Not necessarily approved, but at least knew about. So yeah, I told him, and he said, good, or words, you know, approved conceptually. And, 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 you know, it was all, it would all inure to his benefit as well. So what I did was, uh, I had my own campaign to run. I was running against a uh, fellow from Irvington who was a former councilman or had held some office in the, t in the town. And so he would eat into my um, support in Irvington. Um, Newark was the key. I figured Irvington and South Orange would be uh, close in, and Newark would be strong Democratic. So I opened an office in Irvington for myself and uh, spent most of my time in Brendan's headquarters. Uh, and I would be dealing with county chairmen from around the state um, and trying to coordinate with the folks who were the operatives in the office, uh, while at the same time hitting all of the housewarming and parties and stuff that we had in my district. Because in Newark they didn't know me. And in Irvington, they, you know, didn't really know me. So I had to, I had to spend. I, I didn't practice law at that point. Harold was alone, mm -hmm. together with the rest of the office. Brendan and I were gone. Um, and um, people would come to me when they wanted to talk to Brendan, and he couldn't get to him for whatever reason. And I, I, I was able at that in that manner to kind of get information that you might not otherwise have from folks down at below the visible level, some of which was meaningful and some was not. And I kind of filtered information. The information was filtering through me to Brendan when I thought it made sense. And then I would campaign with him out of Essex County, Hudson in particular. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, I was either going to get the vote in Newark or I was not going to get the vote in Newark. There's not a heck of a lot I could do to affect that. I could make a difference in Irvington and South Orange, and I concentrated there, and I let the party deal with Newark. Mm -hmm. uh, were you confident, uh, as the general starts, that Harry Lerner would pull out all the troops for Brendan Burns' campaign, or did you think might, there might be some lingering reluctance to be a full supporter? Um, I knew Mac Goldman well. My folks live in West Orange. And um, Brendan used to be a lifeguard at his hotel. So he knew Brendan, and he knew Brendan's father. And. I would talk to Mac about what the county was doing, because Mac was on the county committee. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I believed what, ha what, what Mac was telling me. Mac told me that the county was for Brendan. All stops would be pulled out. 
I didn't get that from Harry Lerner, who was playing a little bit reluctant. You know, he had lost. Uh, Brendan didn't know him anything. And, uh, and uh, he wanted to be wooed. But I knew if I were to believe what uh, his, one of his right, one of his right-handed men told me, that the organization was lining up for her and they would, they would do a job for him. So this intelligence was largely through Goldman rather talking directly to Lerner? Yeah, I didn't get it from Harry right away. As it developed, you know, Harry would call and say, look, w you guys, what are you doing? And he would, he would give us advice about Essex and about the rest of the state as well. It became evident that which existed at the very beginning, but you know, I wouldn't have known it except for, uh, I mean, I could have figured it out, mm -hmm. but you never know in politics. Do you recall any meetings with, with uh, Brendan Byrne and Harry Lerner to discuss the campaign? Boy. No. No. That's not to say they didn't happen, but I don't recall. Okay. Well, now you say you have... Probably would have been there. <laughs> okay. But you have more direct contact with the key campaign staff for the Byrne campaign at this point. Um, and let's, let's stop there before we uh, go any further. And Fine. Appreciate that. Okay. Senator, before our break, I was about to ask you about the impressions you had of the key Byrne people that you came to know better during the general election campaign in 1973. Can you describe those people and what your uh, dealings were with them and how you sort of uh, sort of assess them as uh, campaign uh, people? I, I'm going to try to separate uh, the first campaign from the second campaign and sometimes they blur. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there are uh, three people that, well, I shouldn't say that. Let me start with the two most impressive new folks for me. And they were Dick Leon and uh, Lou Caden. Uh, and uh, as I might have mentioned earlier, uh, my recollection is that uh, we, we uh, had the good fortune of their uh, being available uh, when the uh, Dick Coffey, I think, was uh, in the campaign as a candidate and withdrew in the primary and they became available to us and joined our campaign in the general election for the general. And perhaps earlier, I don't remember, but I, I met them in, during the general election. Uh, and uh, I was overwhelmed. Uh, they were uh, extremely bright and are extremely bright. Uh, people. Uh, I've maintained a relationship of sorts with uh, both, but um, almost, you know, from year to year I might see them once here or there. Um, I think that um, they uh, lent a, an insight into the issues that had not yet been covered by any person in the campaign. And they quickly uh, demonstrated uh, their ability to be perceptive, uh, articulate, and uh, sensitive to a state with which they had not had, as far as I knew, and a great deal of exposure. Um, I think Brendan shared that view. But for me, which is where the question is, uh, I, was ex I was very impressed with them. Um, and uh, I would sit in at meetings where policy was being discussed and positions were being taken. Um, and um, those were the two people, I think, most responsible for, uh, for the um, positions that Brendan took. That is not to say that he didn't have his own mind uh, functioning and um, 
and would on occasion, and I can't remember specifically, specifics, um, go in a direction other than where the uh, recommendation <coughs> was, uh, was directing him from either one or both of those two gentlemen. Uh, Alan Sagner uh, w was not a, uh, was not in a position and did not uh, offer policy uh, recommendations and positions, except as it might affect the business community in New Jersey, where he had uh, um, practical experience and was solid in terms of his um, views, in my opinion. Uh, so if you put the, the politics together with the, um, with the uh, economy and the business community in New Jersey, um, those three gentlemen um, were, were gu the guiding lights in the campaign. Not to mention, of course, Allen's ability to assist in fundraising, which was critical. He was our main guy. There were many others uh, who didn't have the, uh, the platform that Allen had in terms of fundraising, but um, there were numerous significant uh, supporters of Brendan who had um, not a large or lengthy experience politically, but were friendly with folks in our campaign. I specifically remember Joe Lordi's, um, Joe Lordi's ability to reach into the uh, Italian business community, Joe and his brother. Uh, and uh, we, we had very successful uh, fundraisers uh, with folks like that who had a particular area of contact. Alan was someone who had across the board access and, um, and we did okay financially, we were fine. Um, those are the three individuals who I think, um, once you're past the pure political considerations, like a Don Lamb, for example, who would be of help with regard to other county chair and persons. Lynn was chairman of Union County. Yes, he Democratic was. Democratic Committee. Yes, he was. Um, I don't, uh, there, there, there came a time when Harry Lerner was on board 100% and it was obvious, as I mentioned earlier. Early on, uh, he was a little reluctant uh, and I think wanted to be uh, romanced. So uh, he, he did, he, he became helpful politically um, as it became more and more apparent that Brendan was going to win. What was your perception of the Hudson County position and role at that point, and who were the key players? Uh, Fitzpatrick was a key, if not the key player. Bayonne. Francis Fitzpatrick, I mean. Fran yeah. Francis Fitzpatrick. Correct, Francis Fitzpatrick. Um, and uh, one of my jobs was to keep in touch with the Hudson folks and make sure that they were happy. Now, um, Mr. Fitzpatrick's representative, if you will, in the Byrne campaign was Jimmy Dugan. And um, Jimmy had um, open access to us and to the campaign and was free to and did uh, participate in fundraising uh, and uh, and politically uh, and, and 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 political activity throughout the state. Uh, he, 
he was going to be a um, significant force in the administration, assuming Brendan won. Uh, you know, Hudson had some things that it wanted in order to support Brendan. I didn't think it was going to be difficult because if Essex was with Ralph DeRose, Hudson would be with someone else, and that someone else was not on the horizon except for Brendan Byrne in the real world. There were other candidates, but I think Brendan was the most logical for them to go to. And um, <clears throat> Brendan had a close relationship with, um, in Hudson County with an attorney who was um, our, our liaison with the, with the Democratic Party, with uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Um, and the negotiations that took place before Brendan, I'm backing up now, actually announced uh, were, were uh, sensitive, uh, difficult, as far as we could tell. But in retrospect, I understand it were, really was not an issue that it was going to happen. Uh, but there had to be a meeting of the minds on a couple of issues that Hudson was interested in and that Brendan had to sign off on. And one was Jimmy Dugan, for example, as the uh, state chairman. The attorney you mentioned, was that Ken McPherson? It was. It is. was. So he was the key intermediary. Communications it went through him. There may have been others, but he's the one that I know who would convey, okay, that's agreeable to us or them. Do you remember any other sort of conditions or requests from Hudson County apart from the chairmanship for Jim Dugan? It is something about an exit on the turnpike <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in Bayonne. Now, you mentioned sort of participating in the discussions about policy positions uh, during the campaign. Uh, the campaign strategy and issue uh, focus changed with the nomination of Congressman Sandman, who was a rabid anti-tax uh, person, over Governor Cahill, who had actually proposed his own statewide broad-based tax uh, during his, his only term in office. What do you recall about those uh, debates within the Byrne campaign about what position to take on a broad-based tax, income tax, or some other type of broad-based statewide tax? What I, what I remember is that uh, it, it was not uh, deemed um, wise to be supportive of a statewide tax in the face of New Jersey's history and a candidate in, in opposition who was opposed to it. Um, and the, the discussions uh, that we had had to do with how to be honest and truthful with regard to uh, that issue because we, we, need, we need to balance the budget and we were, and, and, and we were not in favor of gimmicks. I mean, Brendan really wanted to do it right, but he also wanted to see whether or not we could avoid a broad-based tax. Um, <clears throat> that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that uh, would serve uh, as a, a function of raising money only. And we talked about the problem with the uh, with the real estate taxes, and whether or not there could be a combined approach where we would attempt to reduce one and replace it with another, or at least partially accomplish that objective. Uh, and so we discussed uh, an income tax uh, might be something that we would de have to deal with down the road and accomplish two things. One, raise money if necessary from a new source, 
and to, to um, reduce the burden of the real estate taxes, which were not as bad as they are now, but certainly a problem for a lot of people. Uh, but we didn't have to cross the bridge, we thought, at, at that time. And so um, my recollection is Brendan's position ultimately became one that he was comfortable with and that he believed in, and that is uh, that he did not foresee an income tax in the foreseeable future. The word foreseeable um, was uh, intentionally selected as meaning not tomorrow, but it might occur sooner rather than later, depending on what happened to the economy and, and uh, New Jersey in particular. So in your recollection, there was a deliberate strategic decision to choose that word foreseeable, or was it more an off-the-cuff I don't comment? think uh, it was the latter. I don't think it was intentionally selected with that in mind. It just evolved. Mm -hmm. Because we really didn't know, A, whether it was viable as a concept. I mean, you know, before you start to run, run off with that, you've got to know that you've got a chance of making it happen, mm -hmm. and B, that it's necessary. And um, I don't think we had a handle, at least I didn't, on what, on what the economics of the situation were completely. I mean, I hadn't sat through budget hearings, and I wasn't quite sure what was going on. But I knew, and we all knew, and I think uh, Leon in particular knew that there was a problem. In your own campaign, were you getting attacked by your Republican opponent on the tax issue, asking you to pledge that you would never vote for a broad-based tax? Never. Never. Never came up. Now, as the, can as the polls show Brendan Byrne pretty comfortably ahead, going into the general election in November. Was there any debate within the campaign of saying, well, you know, we have this one, why don't we come out more forthrightly about the need for a more stable statewide revenue source to deal with the property tax problem and the school, school finance problem? I don't recall any such event occurring. And I'm not suggesting that there was an acknowledgement that our position was not a forthright position. As the campaign sort of wound down toward November, <coughs> uh, were you supremely confident that Brendan Byrne was going to be elected governor? I was confident. In fact, uh, and I believe uh, Dick Leone has said in his uh, earlier session uh, during this series, uh, he actually created a transition committee during the campaign, uh, as opposed to waiting until the election results in November. Were you involved in, at all in that and sort of s suggesting who might be helpful on the parallel transition committee that was working while there was a, a, a formal campaign no, organization? No, I don't remember being involved. Do you remember any of the people who were involved? I believe Dave Goldberg was one, some, some of the other prominent Democrats from prior administrations. No, I do not remember. Okay. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. I just don't recall it. I was busy with my campaign. I was busy with his campaign. And I knew something was going on over there, in t going on in the sense that preparations were being made for victory. But I don't know the people. I don't remember the people being identified to me. Now, we've also had comments from Dick Leone and others involved in the campaign that Brendan Byrne was not the most effective campaigner on the stump or a speaker. What was your own impression of, of his abilities as a day-to-day -day campaigner? He's much better now. <laughs> He's much better now. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we were working with uh, clothes, uh, pres presence, uh, and general speaking ability. Um, How would you rate him? 
at that time, um, the best thing that I can say about him <laughs> is that we are fortunate in who his uh, opponent was. <laughs> um, he just got better each day, but he started from such a, a uh, um, an unflattering beginning and position that he had to get better. There was no other place to go. <laughs> and he did. Uh, and he became more comfortable. And as he sensed what we all sensed, uh, he became more confident. And with the confidence came a more relaxed approach. I can't say that it happened between X and Y period of time, but it was clear that at the end of the campaign, he was a campaigner. Um, he was not the best campaigner that ever campaigned, but he was, he was certainly, uh, he was, uh, had gone through some battles and he knew how to handle himself in terms of questions and being uh, attacked by an opponent who really did not attack f effectively. So it, it, w it would be like uh, he started, Brendan started to become uh, a one-line response, bright, uh, and this, the thing you see now was just beginning toward the end of his campaign. Given the many years that you had known him. Excuse me, I want to tell you he made a wonderful appearance physically. I mean, he was a good looking man. Um, and he carried himself very well. Uh, and, and the press, you know, would kid about his clothes and his shoes and his white bucks and things like that. But it was cute, mm -hmm. you know. But given Excuse that me, one more thing. <laughs> Uh, and they all knew that he didn't come from money mm -hmm. and that he wasn't buying anything uh, with money and that whatever he achieved, he achieved on the basis of his ability. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you may recall how, how the, uh, the uh, public reacted to the press's um, disclosure of a wire tag, uh, uh, tap that uh, law enforcement had set up with regard to some folks in organized crime who mentioned that Brendan couldn't be bought. So once that happened, the man who couldn't be bought, you know, became almost, I mean, it couldn't, you couldn't have planned this and it wasn't planned because it was obviously it was said by guys who really were f frustrated at the fact that they were going to look, they were looking at somebody who was probably going to be elected and they couldn't make a deal. Mm -hmm. And I suppose his awkwardness as a campaigner might have been a plus during that campaign. Yeah, he was fresh, new, not in politics. I mean, everything was working for him. Even, the, even, even stumbling in, in speeches and, and debates. It was looked at as a, it was looked at, I think, as a honest, fresh face. Mm -hmm bright Harvard Princeton. I mean, how could you, you know, mm -hmm. can't be bored. How could you lose? <laughs> <laughs> Since you had known him for so many years before 1973, uh, did you get some feeling uh, as he's thinking about becoming a candidate for governor that his awkwardness as a speaker or other liabilities as a campaigner might be a detriment in the we campaign? Were, we were worried. You were worried. Uh, we were worried. Because that all we knew was him. We didn't know who he was going to run against. We didn't know what that person was going to be able to say or do, um, and and we really didn't. I mean, we didn't know about you can't be bought, and that stuff happened unplanned, and it all just fell into place. Uh, yes, we were worried. We I remember trying to uh, talk about and getting him some help. Uh, from some experts in terms of presentation and speech, et cetera. But he became Brendan Byrne. I mean, he always was what he is now. It's just uh, he's had some more experience and, uh, and his, uh, his sense of humor has, uh, has attracted people th throughout his exposure as a politician. He's really not a politician in the sense that most people view politicians. Uh, he's a guy that did a job, and I think history will reflect that he did a good job. Did you have any contact with some of those campaign professionals like David Garth? I did. Tell us about that. 
<laughs> um, first of all, uh, my college roommate is an individual who uh, had a rather successful advertising agency, and um, I, uh, I approached him about handling the campaign, and, and um, he said that they didn't want to do that because they don't, they really don't want to, they don't like to deal with politicians and political races. But, and he mentioned David Garth's name, uh, and um, um, David tried to change Brendan. And uh, to a certain extent, he was successful. Um, and, and, and Brendan, God bless him, I mean, took criticism in a very, he, he's so, uh, so self-deprecating uh, at times that you can't believe it's really true that the guy feels that way. But he would, he would make fun of himself and uh, occasionally get upset with the criticism if it got to be a little too heavy. But if you approach them, and I think, I think Garth did in the right way, um, you got all you could get. And I think he did a good job. And that was in pacing, sort of speaking more clearly, uh, yeah. um, a little lightening up his approach, just exactly how do you think uh, he improved as a candidate under Garth? tutelage? Well, he was able to, and did, um, rely more on his wit and his sense of humor than he did at, at the outset. Um, and I'm not talking now about delivering a speech that was written. I'm talking about his reaction to it in a debate, for example, or in a, uh, in a press conference. Um, Brevity became his his uh, his uh, forte. He was able to convey succinctly and um, and uh, with a a humorous slant or overtone that which he want, which was serious. That is to say, the subject was serious, but he was able to do it. And I, you know, in a in a concise and and uh, manner that people would understand. I think that Garth helped him get there. I think he always had that. I mean, I remember sitting in the prosecutor's office on our Friday morning meetings, and he would be funny. He was with comfortable, he was with friends, he was people that were all together. And here he was in this world where guys wanted to kill him. I mean, I don't mean organized crime, I'm, although they probably did, I don't know. Uh, but I mean, it was either the Republicans were going to win or he was going to win. So um, and we had some, we had some dirty pool. I don't remember all of it, you know. But the, in retrospect, it's the kind of thing that you always expect, you know, mm -hmm. when you, what you, what's in your background that we, we don't know. I knew everything that was in Brendan's background, I thought, and I still think I did. And there was nothing there. So whatever they came up with was not going to be significant. Mm -hmm. And it got to be petty and, you know, and he let, started to let that stuff roll off him and he didn't react to it. I think Arthur did a good job in getting him there. Did you attend any of the Burn Sandman debates? Yeah, I did. I and what were they like? Well, we laughed at the right places <laughs> <laughs> because he was funny. And it was, uh, it was clear that, at least to us, and we're trying to be critical about it, that uh, he had it well in hand. Did uh, he resent the long hours that you're required to put in as a campaigner? <sighs> he, he liked to go to bed earlier than the campaign schedule would permit him. And he was, well, let's go, let's go, you know, let's... Um, he was impatient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it wasn't because I'm sorry. Uh, it wasn't because um, you know he didn't um, he didn't want to work. It was because his whole life was lived in a certain way where he didn't stay up late, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and he and he l needed exercise, and it was inconsistent with you know appearances from eight in the morning until eleven at night. 
uh, and and it, it became clear that it, to continue him as an effective campaigner, we had to deal with that and get him back into as his schedule as much as possible. Any anecdotes you recall about go on cam on the campaign trail? Well, he loved um, white castles. <laughs> And we, I he, mean, he's the one. <laughs> we would, you know, we'd stop. Oh, there's, there's one over there, and, and uh, we'd stop, and he would eat. Nobody else would eat that stuff. Uh, I shouldn't say that. There are a lot of people that like that. Those of us around him were not. But uh, Brendan would uh, like that. He would like to break and play some tennis if he could, even for a half hour somewhere. Uh, and he loved campaigning uh, in a place where he would be with folks like Hudson County people. That was fun for him. Mm -hmm. He'd walk down the street and he liked to do that and, and shake their hands and stop and talk. He enjoyed that. Um, so he liked more the street campaigning than the no media question. and the big event campaign? No question. He was very comfortable with the former. And I shouldn't say nervous with the latter, but uh, more more uh, concerned about it than hitting the streets. And what about your own campaign? Did you feel that you maybe you weren't spending enough time given your role in the burn campaign? Yeah, I was a uh, I was a little upset with the fact that I wasn't getting more um, into more homes in Irvington and South Orange, which is where the votes are. Those are the active people. Those are the ones with families. Those are the ones with friends that are politically active. I had friends setting those things up for me, and sometimes I couldn't make it. I had to cancel. Um, but, and it's not to say that I didn't want to win or that I would have been just as satisfied if Brendan won and I lost. No, I, r I wanted to win. But if, if I were asked to go cover for him somewhere and speak, which I did, uh, or debate somebody locally who was appearing for Sandman, uh, I felt an obligation to do that. I just, I, I, let me put it this way. I probably did as much as I could do, even if I had more time. I hit everything, but in retrospect, I knew that. I didn't know it at the time. I was looking at a win, and I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize that. But if I had to make a choice between two places to go, if I couldn't get somebody to cover for Brendan, I went. And, and, and that was more often than not, I, if it were someplace local, they would come to me and ask me because uh, I was a local, local guy. In those days, how important were the newspapers and their editorial endorsements and also their coverage uh, in elections in New Jersey? <clears throat> uh, I, I don't think it's terribly different today than it was then. So in answer, those days are like these days. They're important. Mm -hmm. Press can, I think press can hurt you more than they can help you. Um, I think press uh, was favorable generally to Brendan. And he, I think, did well with newspaper people because I think they believed that he was honest with them and straight, as much as a polit any politician can be. You can't say everything that's on your mind without, uh, without being um, irresponsible as a po politician, but you can avoid lying and you can avoid misrepresenting. Um, and he had that, you know, he had that rapport with the press because he had a good relationship with them as a prosecutor. And, uh, and there was no negative. There was, nothing, there was nothing about Brendan that was negative that they had. What were the politics of the sort of key newspapers at the time in terms of their ownership and editorial leanings? <clears throat> uh, well, the most important newspaper was the Star-Ledger. The uh, evening news had long gone out of existence. 
So we had one paper, and the New York papers, Philadelphia paper. Um, my own view of, uh, what's his name, Mort Pye, was that he shared a lot of Brendan's uh, values. Of course, Mort Pye was the longtime editor of the Star Ledger. Correct. Um, and they treated Brendan very well, the Star Ledger did. I think they did an even-handed uh, presentation of uh, Charlie Sandman's campaign. I think they did a good job for a newspaper, which is what their job is, even-handed. But you could tell by reading, um, and ultimately the editorial position, which was favorable to Brendan, you could tell by reading the uh, coverage, for example, of a uh, debate uh, that uh, they were sympathetic to Brendan's positions and to his campaign and to the personality. Um, it was all good. I, it was, I didn't know how good it was because it was really the first campaign I was involved in. How about your own campaign in terms of you selling your candidacy to the Star-Ledger? Did you attend an editorial board meeting and what were the types of issues that came up there? I did uh, with the, the local papers in Irvington and South Orange as well as the Star Ledger, all three. They all ultimately endorsed me. Uh, and, and what they wanted to know about was uh, income tax was an issue. Um, law enforcement was an issue. <coughs> um, they knew about my labor background and they wanted to know how I felt about labor related issues. And they wanted to know about my relationship with Brendan Byrne and I told them. Um, I remember being asked in the ledger's office, editorial o um, office, um, whether I would be my own man in terms of a position that Brendan might have had that, that I uh, did not support. And uh, I said I would, but I couldn't conceive of one that was really a significant issue where we would disagree because I, I knew him well and I think he knew me and, or at least from my perspective, we were on the same page on everything that was consequential. And you know, considering he was um, of a different religion and grew up in a different environment, uh, that had absolutely no impact on our views and doesn't today, does not today. You know, he's like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable with him um, than almost anybody that I know in terms of my own views on, on morality, issues of morality, sexuality, uh, the church, relationship to Judaism, etc. Children, marriage. It's like uh, talking to myself when I talk to him. What about abortion? It wasn't a major issue, I guess, in that campaign, but it was becoming an issue both nationally and in New Jersey. And here is Brendan Byrne as a Roman Catholic. Uh, did you discuss abortion? You're right, it was not a major issue in the campaign. I don't remember it being raised, frankly, as an issue in the campaign. I have discussed abortion with him, but not in the political context and certainly not in that campaign. It was never raised. Okay. Before we close for this session, <coughs> I wanted to get your Recollections of election day and election night. Well, I was out um, campaigning uh, throughout election day, even though uh, they told me it's a waste of time. I, I had missed some time, as for obvious reasons, with, with Brendan's campaign. Uh, uh, in the background. 
Uh, and so I went to the various headquarters to see how the votes were coming, and I went, checked with the local unions, which were doing the turning, turning the vote out for us. Um, and uh, I had key people in Irvington and South Orange who were working with me on, on behalf of my campaign, and, and they were uh, reporting about the, uh, reporting to me as I would travel around or call about what kind of turnout they were getting and what they heard, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then I would stop in at Brendan's headquarters, and we kept circling. I really wasn't accomplishing much, but I was, I was too keyed up at that point to not do anything, so I thought about going to the movies and reading a book. I couldn't do any of that. And uh, I don't remember seeing Brendan that day until the end, that they, uh, when he won. And I remember I had my dad with me uh, at my headquarters, which was in, uh, in South Orange, and took the returns there and spoke to my people, that is those who had been working with me in my campaign, um, thanked them, cried. Uh, and then we all went over to Brendan's campaign headquarters. Um, I assume your father was very proud that day. Well, I, yeah. Yeah, he cried. Why don't we break for this session and we'll continue on with your subsequent career in the legislature in Atlantic City and as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, thank you for today. I just, uh, you're welcome and thank you very much. I just, I think I'll say it now, you'll find out after our next session that I just cannot hold a job. I just can't. <laughs> I seem to be moving on in other places. But thanks again and I look forward to, to coming back here. Thank you.